Welcome everyone to the Victory Farm Center for the Humanities and the Cascadia Networks seminar on Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit. Um, so I wanted to open by saying that Bert um, was, was correct in, in pointing out that this is a section of the text, the preface, uh, that we could easily spend a really productive two weeks on. And, and so we actually did some of the introductory, some of the introductory stuff off camera beforehand. Um, but it would still be great if everyone's able to introduce themselves um, for those joining us and kind of watching this after the fact so you know who's who. Um, but uh, a lot of people have already kind of shared what they were doing and what they are doing in life, where they're from, kind of that kind of stuff. And uh, so one, one way of doing this is we have a bunch of different kind of questions for kind of situating the space. Uh, and we're also going to move through the syllabus just to um, establish the process and ground rules because some people really, really appreciate that and rightfully so. Welcome. Hi. Yeah. Did you cut your hair? I did. Rock and roll. All right. Oh no, there's a spot right here actually if you if you want to be able to be seen by camera at all. Otherwise you're all right right there. I'm fine here. Cool. Uh, sorry, off camera people. Uh, there's there's a, a friend just arrived, so So let's lead off with with the introductions. Um, we have a lot of questions that everyone can answer, and we're not going to go in some kind of a rotation. So instead, let's just start out with um, those who are coming in on this, uh, on the quote unquote beginner's track, which we're all beginners when it comes to Hegel, right? But uh, what that means is that some people are looking to get a gisty kind of foothold in the text, whereas other people are reading it cover to cover, right? And so. Um, so for, for, for people who are on that track right now, um, how's that going? What, what's that like? What, 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 what has been the experience so far? <laughs> well, can I maybe interject a little bit? One of the people on the computer? Yes. Yeah, um, I found it, I've been finding it interesting reading the text because um, I jumble around between different texts. I take the Frederick Jameson, Slavoj Žižek approach of uh, the text is not necessarily a developmental tool, but you're jumping around different moments. And in reading different moments, you kind of get different readings out of them. So I found it interesting, particularly because between reading the phenomenology and reading some, something like, let's say, Hegel's early fragments on love, I've been able to find new, richer uh, readings on taking on from my live experience and then rendering something through the text. How is it that the text kind of functions almost like a crucifix, something in which I'm trying to reflect through. So I've been finding it very interesting in the sense of the, the fluidity of the text more than anything, that the text is very fluid, pretty dynamic. It's not something that you can uh, fix as a concept, as many philosophers may try to say that Hegel is an absolute idealist. So there's something fluid to the text and it, it's very humbling going through a text like that. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. And it, and it looks like everyone else has the hang of this already where you just self mute, but then unmute at will and realize that just as Simone just did, that is the way to interject from the internet because if you're online, the tendency will be, we'll speak over you and just cut in. You're, you, the volume is up loud enough that you'll be able to, and it sure beats raising your hand. Just, just interject. We will always try to cede to the person online. Um, so a few, a few other questions. Who, uh, why are you doing this? What you hope to gain? Why Hegel matters? Would anyone like to go with any of those questions? Um, I, I think I'll try and actually answer all three. And what's your name? I'm, uh, I'm Robert Bradley. I, I don't know if Dave knows me. <laughs> um, but uh, on, on why I'm doing this, I, I can't quite answer that. Maybe just a sense of self-destruction, you know, a bit of a death drive, but I think I also have to provide the serious answer of this, uh, if nothing else then for posterity, that um, in reality, Hegel is 
and this kind of goes into why Hegel is important, but Hegel is one of the most important philosophical thinkers because basically everything after the phenomenology is people responding to it, either saying it's wrong or saying it's completely right or it's a mix of both. You know, I doubt we have many of the ideologies we have today and the forms we have them without Hegel. We definitely wouldn't have communism as we know it. We definitely wouldn't have Marxism. Uh, we definitely wouldn't have many, many uh, things that formed out of the reaction to Hegel. And so I think that as myself, someone who's trying to be a good philosophy student and trying to learn about philosophy, especially in the last several hundred years when it has just been, you know, insane and this ground of radical expression, I think that all starts with Hegel and really the ghosts that have haunted our society are both uh, sometimes captured by Hegel, but sometimes started by Hegel. I think he asked questions we're still struggling to answer today. And so for me, at least, reading Hegel is kind of something you have to do if you really want to be involved in modern philosophy. Wow, that was pretty thorough. Does anybody have anything to add to the why Hegel, why now question? or Because it will be coming back to this the whole seminar, so it's not something we have to do. Yeah. Well, Hegel, I was just reading the preface. He'll be talking about his own time, and I'll go, oh, my God, that's my time, too. Mm -hmm. The, um, you know, the vacuous absolute or the... Uh, the the either or binaries that uh, never the train shall meet. Uh, all of that is stuff that's going on, and it's also things that are current to you know common understandings too. Basically, Hegel, for me, uh, just introduces me to a um, thinking more systematically about the thing, and. Um, I, I'm starting to find it to be like poetry. I love him as much as Walt Whitman, which is a lot. So. Maybe maybe one last one from either Lucas or Tyler. I know the two of you are huge, huge into. Well, I think that in particular, if you wanted to look at very, very contemporary uh, continental philosophy, Almost all of it, in one way or another, is a revitalization of Hegel and the Hegelian legacy. Uh, I think this is particularly true since what seems to define a lot of continental philosophy in the 21st century is a rejection of, you know, so-called post-structural philosophers, whether that's, you know, uh, Coe or Derrida. Deleuze is a little bit trickier, I think, of a case, but... Nonetheless, what's involved here, at least uh, in some formulations, is a rejection of transcendental philosophy. Uh, Catherine Malibu just wrote a recent book about uh, Kant and epigenetics that's all about uh, the possibility of relinquishing the transcendental uh, and transcendental philosophy. And that, the first person to really reject transcendental philosophy in a way that become an outline for this maneuver for... Uh, fosters moving forward is Hegel. Uh, and so I think it's a particularly contemporary uh, sort of philosopher, despite the fact that he was writing. <laughs> Thanks, Tyler. And so just uh, we'll, we'll kind of be jumping around between uh, syllabus and, and kind of questions that, that everyone can kind of discuss on uh, for the first, like, you know, half hour here. Um, so let's just jump to the syllabus for a minute. And, and the, part of the reason for the jumping around, my personal, it is my personal preference, hopefully everyone else is not too irritated by it. It's, it's because the most annoying thing in my experience with syllabus, with the syllabus is like, it's an essential piece so that everyone kind of has some common basis. Like we, we all know what this is about or whatever, but at the same time, it's really easy to just kind of fall into reading something off, right? And, um, and so we'll, kind of, we'll, we'll try to keep it a little more organic than that. But um, 
<laughs> you'll notice that the first quote is by Tyler, and then the first preparation resource um, is Tyler. And so Tyler was the person who was just speaking. Tyler has joined us twice in the past to do special talks, once on Kant and the other time on Fichte, um, both situating Hegel and his milieu. Uh, those are on our channel, highly recommend. Um, they'll be referenced going forward, so this is something to, to check out. Um, curious, how many people were able to check out the Half Hour Hegels? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Absolutely. Super wow, awesome. so Super. how about online? Anyone check out the Dr. Sadler Half Hour Hegels? I'm seeing a yes from Simone, Sammy. Yes, Lucas, awesome. Um, is, it, is, 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 is everybody just listening to them, trying to like listen to them sequentially, or how, how are you using them, Brian? Um, basically, my method for this week, I'll be playing with it as we go, but I read through the preface once, just dry, and then I went back to it, and as I was reading it again, any paragraph I came to that was like, a, oh, fuck, what was that? I'd go to Half Hour Hegel and like watch that or whatever was on the video, because there's three per, so i just watch all three, take a shitload of notes, and then it usually helped me for like three more pages, and then I'd stumble again. You know, so it's kind of like training wheels to some degree. You know, like when I'm tipping, I then find something old me up a little bit. So. That's awesome. Yeah, and uh, Dr. Uh, Sadler actually joined us like a week and a half ago, I think, um, to, to, to give us some tips and tricks, and he gave us tips for about 45 minutes of an hour and a half video. And if you go to that video, it says in the description where you can skip to just to watch for the tips and tricks. But um, we'll be talking, uh, there's kind of a meta conversation. There's a lot of meta conversations that come out of, especially philosophy like this, right? But one of them is how to read a text, how to read a difficult text, and moreover, how to read a text in continental philosophy. Um, and so once th what I just did was I used jargon. And, and one of the things that, I don't know if it's spelled out too clearly in the syllabus, but it definitely comes up in people's responses to the surveys here. There are special requests from people to, we should be trying to unpack jargon. Um, metacognition is how they talk about it at my work. The idea is that you are taking what you've internalized, what you already understand, and, and you're, you're assuming that other people don't necessarily, they haven't internalized that yet. And it, you can't just signify what you're referencing inside of yourself. You want to try to pull that out in the open. You want to try to talk about it in, in, its, in its mechanisms, right? So that even if I kind of have a foggy notion of what is meant by continental philosophy, I'd still be like, but what is that? And that's okay. And that we're as a process of norming here, trying to open up a space where um, it's okay to be asking what some people might think is a stupid question, because there is no stupid question. Um, if, 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 even if you think that it's a stupid question, it's probably like you really just think, it could be framed better. And then we have a conversation about that, right? So continental philosophy is, who wants to take a stab at saying that in a couple sentences? Philosophy from the continent. <laughs> more or less, it is from Fran uh, France and Germany, more or less. Um, really though, it's, it's whatever kind of philosophy is extremely influential in the world that gets excluded by the Anglo-Saxon um, waspy sort of uh, hegemony of, of so. British American imperialism. Um, and the so. reason for that is because there are Thanks. kinds of philosophy. Oh, what's that? What about, what about Asian philosophy? Yeah. yeah. What about it? It's not continental. Oh, you're right. That's super Eurocentric of me. Um, <laughs> so I mean, African good. or Native American. Oh, like, it's, of Europe. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, well, and it definitely Eastern philosophy gets excluded as well from the canon. Um, but analytic philosophy is not the traditional canon either. It tries to be ahistorical. It tries to not be Eurocentric. It tries to be completely like we're just dealing with the facts and it's just logic. And, and maybe it'll go out in, into epistemological or metaphysical kind of excursion. Actually, it kind of lives in epistemology these days. Um, uh, characterizations of analytic philosophy? Yeah, I'll just say real quick, like historically, analytic philosophy, and hi, I'm the ghost behind the camera. Um, I don't think I even introduced myself. I'm Sammy. Um, analytic and continental philosophy, that division is, it comes after Hegel, essentially. There's like a 
there's kind of a split in the tradition be between what people took from Hangul. So it's really funny that we're even talking about it. Um, and it, it essentially just, it, it's usually characterized as dense texts that are um, sort of circular or a lot of times analytic philosophers at our department at Boise State would call it nonsensical or um, it's it's a different mode of thinking. It's usually based on a sort of dialectical thinking or um, comes at things in a roundabout way. <laughs> I can't remember, was it you, Bert, you said that, or no, someone said that continental philosophers were like failed poets or poets who tried to be philosophers or something like that. I don't know if it was. I was right. just thinking there, there were no continental philosophies, what philosophy would be if uh, Russell Moore and Wittgenstein had all been poisoned at a, at a party one night. Um, so so, so out some Simone's got a quick. Um, so uh, I, I just really quick, just drawing people's attention to page two of the syllabus. Simone was using the hand signals that we'll be incorporating and practicing and potentially refining, but for the time being, two fingers is a quick reply on whatever note is being discussed at the time. So, and as it is the nature of philosophy, we may see whether this is actually a quick response. But uh, what is of interest to me and something we haven't dealt with yet is the question of language in philosophy. I mean, we very well know, some of us, that there's such a thing as the uh, linguistic turn in philosophy. We find this in major thinkers like Heidegger or Derrida. Uh, Hegel, for that matter, uh, one of the main questions we'll have to struggle with is how is it that Hegel uses language? Uh, whether there's a way of fixing language to get in, uh, language words to stick to the things they refer to, or whether there's a fluidity in language that he develops in this process. Uh, one that, and that's one of the major issues of interest to me. I find that analytic philosophy is very uniformal oftentimes with the way it tries to approach language. And one of my major, major worries, because that's that's the form of philosophy I, I was mostly taught, taught in my under, uh, undergrad was analytic philosophy. And one of my major preoccupations with it was that it presumes a sort of universalization of the English language. That uh, it comes back to the problem of uh, the la uh, has it that my language um, mimics the world I'm seeking to describe. And if I'm only using the English language, what things have I lost or castrated myself from in trying to uh, engage with the question, right? So um, I think Hegel, because of his very dynamic use of language, can uh, uh, resist th this issue as much. So we'll, I, I kind of want to suggest that this problem of the analytic and continental debate, uh, however much of a misnomer it may be, it still rests on this question of the linguistic terms that even though we claim to be past it, we haven't really kind of been past it. <laughs> yeah. Right. R right, like the idea of the co of the notion, it's right? Set of fingers. Yeah, and yeah. George is on the also. So, so wait, hold on one second. Jacob, was that, we sorry. Okay, yeah. I just, I just can't help but feel that the division to me has to do with genre. They they strike me as different genres, because um, I think when you when you boil down to some of the things that are being said in analytic philosophy, uh, there's like strong resonances with certain things that are being said in continental philosophy. So it, there's not like this strong division between content, um, but there is definitely a division in terms of style and. Like, this isn't a hard, fast rule, because, like, Milasu borrows heavily from uh, analytic philosophy in his work, in his writing style. Um, but I can't help but think that analytic philosophy is a lot more influenced by writing in the sciences. Um, it tends to have papers. They tend to be short. They tend to be to the point. You have uh, an argument you have propositions and axioms and you come to conclusions. Uh, whereas continental philosophy to me is much more influenced by a literary tradition. Um, and I think it's influenced by Hegel and Heidegger insofar as it takes history very seriously. Um, whereas I think analytic philosophy tends to um, think more in a vacuum. And I think that comes from the scientific influence. So we don't have, so, so if you read like Deleuze, he's just going through all these different people in the history of philosophy. If you go through Heidegger, he's like listing everything that he has to go through before he can get to his point. Whereas in analytic philosophy, it's just, here's the point. Um, and I think that has to do with this 
part of continental philosophy that's like, well, we can't understand where we are unless we understand where we've already been. Um, and it has that strong historical component. But I think you can get that in analytic philosophy. So to me, the division is a lot more uh, in terms of style and genre, almost more than anything else. I would only... At, only at this down. point, yeah. at this point, I think that earlier there were probably stronger divisions, especially at the birth of analytic philosophy with Bertrand Russell. But um, I think at this point, it's much more stylistic in its division. I, and part of the reason is because analytic philosophy is slowly a, appropriating various pieces from, from continental philosophy. Um, I, I, will, I will kind of recapitulate or summarize really quick just my basic impression having gone through an analytic program. I'm not, I don't mean to like, oh, it's bad. I think it's actually really good. There's a lot of tools that you can, you can take out of that style. Um, but this, the basic idea that, you know, one has failed poets doing, you know, philosophy and the, and the other one is uh, failed scientists doing philosophy. It's a funny joke, but it's almost, it feels almost kind of true, right? Like the, and really like I, I see people like Heidegger, I, I can't say how much Hegel, uh, almost like, they come up with this elaborate system to show why the prevailing system and its common sense doesn't really work uh, for kinds of truth like poetry or art, because there is there, those are modes of truth uh, for a lot of people working in the continental tradition. Not everyone. It's not a very easy binary. So, yeah. That's and so it was just for Dave. If you were defining continental versus, and you said British and American, for all, can, can you finish that? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, Jacob was like, hold on. I left out the East. I mean, all of it is valid, but can you do it? Yeah, the basic thought there is just that uh, the it, 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 continental philosophy tends to uh, do political philosophy and uh, social theory at the same time as kind of working within many fields. Where analytic philosophy tends to work within its own domain. Whereas the other one's very interdisciplinary and drawing off of every resource in the uh, available. And that's the British you mentioned only about empire. That's kind of yeah, I was just saying that I don't, continental philosophy doesn't really work well for the service of empire. That that's an argument people might want to push back against, but I just kind of like to throw it out there because it's you're probably not going to get a job in a philosophy department getting tenure in, in the U.S. You know, doing this and, and and why? Who does it benefit? Simone has a thing in the mind. I just want actually. I just want to say real quick. So yes. I, I, uh, I'm facilitating. I will um, call on people. We, everyone will get to say their piece. No one has to be interrupted. Everyone can. It's all right. So, um, so yeah. Uh, Simone. Yeah, uh, my comment is pretty brief. I think uh, if we get hung up right now on the debate of continental and analytic philosophy. Uh, I want to just put forward a little bit of a recommendation. Uh, there's a book by a very short book by Simon Critchley, uh, which is a very short introduction to continental philosophy. And one of the things that he kind of points out uh, that sometimes gets undermined is that the co analytic continental debate, in a sense, kind of predates someone like Russell, for example, who uh, I just heard he was named the origin of the debate. But um, you can see it as early as, like, for example, debates between Bentham and the Romantic poets of uh like within england itself you kind of see this kind of two cultures uh theory of the analytic continental debate arising so just to kind of cast away at least some suppositions of how we talk about this debate i just wanted to uh, put a little bit of a suggestion of a very short book that deals with the subject i think pretty fairly um yeah awesome sammy oh yeah oh no i was literally just responding to george and saying yeah a anglo as in like Brit British American tradition of philosophy is analytic. That's how that's what I needed to be okay. Yeah. More or less, yeah. Um, and now we'll move to the ground rules section here. We've already practiced a couple. Um, oh, I'll actually, would, would anyone like to share the current overarching goal and, and weekly goals? These are, these are subject to change as we all fine tune this process, but yeah. It's on the first page, overarching point. Yeah, copies of that. Are we yeah, there, are <laughs> there are some going around, yeah. And while, while, while everyone gets situated with their syllabus, I'll just, the, the whole reason continental philosophy came up is because I was saying, 
that's going to be a real big meta uh, com uh, conversation repeated throughout all of this is how to read this kind of stuff in continental philosophy, especially it's not, it, it is its own thing. Um, Hegel, Husserl, Heidegger, Derrida, Deleuze, uh, Foucault, Levinas, all these people, Butler are, it's, their, it's its own thing and there's not like a school you can go to for freshmen where they're going to tell you how to do that, right? It's kind of assumed that you kind of did that prep work yourself before getting into grad school at some weird grad school that actually does that kind of thing, right? Oh, I can read the, yes, yes. the overarching goal. Our goal is to struggle together in the endeavor of understanding Hegel's phenomenology of spirit through a rigorous reading regimen and weekly presentations discussions. In so doing, we hope to gain a better understanding of this great text, ourselves, and the world. It's a good goal. And then weekly goals, it should be Oh, weekly there. goals. One, to be able to say what the central antimony is antimony? Antinomy. Antinomy. Is for each section, then how the next section is a solution. Two, to share tips and tactics for struggling with text such as this. And three, generating weekly questions to think through with the group. Another thing, I actually added this online. Um, so if you have the living document, I think you should be able to see an addition there. Um, it's not just questions to think through with everyone. It's also key passages you would really like to hone in on. We'll get to a, a part here in, in about the uh, next 15 minutes when we'll just say, hey, everyone, so what are those paragraphs that you really marked up and would like to talk about? And I'll just kind of bubble those up on the whiteboard here, and the ones where there's overlap, we'll just dig into those. So, um, Rules on the next page, All right? Oh, no, wait. ground rules. Ground rules. Ground rules. So we're cultivating a community of critical recognition. Okay. Critical recognition. There's a whole um, body of work on the on recognition theory on um, the Encyclopedia of Philosophy. The Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy is a fantastic resource if you're interested in recognition theory. Um, it basically comes out of Hegel. And the, and, and the idea is, is that um, we, we come into being, we, for, we form subjectivity vis-a-vis -vis the other, vis-a-vis -vis recognition. There are, all so, there are all sorts of types of recognition, but the one I'm basically using here is affirmation and negation. Um, you, it's not recognition if they cannot affirm or deny. The possibility has to be there. The potentiality has to be there. So more than ever, folks feel isolated or unheard. By committing your attention, putting away the phone, et cetera, you can help ameliorate this. Recognition is an essential component of identity formation, community building, and the creative and intellectual projects that produce culture. Would someone like to read two? I can read two. And we'll just kind of read through the rest and just kind of speed through, and then we'll cut right to the, get into the book. The necessary conditions for even having a civil discourse, as far as we can tell, A, ongoing effort to practice respect, good faith, and benefit of the doubt. Civility is not the absence of conflict, but instead how conflicts are reasonably navigated. Within reason, license must be given for dif differences, disagreement, and critique, while committing the time and energy for active listening, learning, and discovering shared values and concerns. Three generous readings receive criticism. With both the text as well as with comrades, we try to maintain critical interpretations alongside the generous read. Four, respect, authority, assume the other is not reducible to a stereotypical caricature and get benefit of the doubt. Human tendencies to pigeonhole others with the associations we have of the ideas they express fight this tendency. Do five, John. Yeah, be aware of the space you take up when you do speak, so that if you are speaking substantially more than others, you can then try to step back more often so others can step forward. I think that goes along too with number six. If you speak rather infrequently, please consider taking the floor to posit ideas or questions more often. Becoming comfortable with going out on a limb and stating a thought in draft mode is an essential skill to participation in a community such as this. Um, 
seven. Our seminars are free and open to the public for now. All that we ask is a serious commitment of time and energy to reading this text and that you come to discussions prepared with questions or at least the questioning earnestness of a learner. We cannot pay us with money to give you the experience of struggling with the text and we cannot monetize the wealth you bring to discussion when having done so. This non-economic transaction is transaction is infinite slash priceless and we thank you for it. If we're at a point where several people are trying to talk at once, which is rare but does happen, and you wish to get your piece in without having to struggle for the space to do so, then there are signals you can use with the facilitator. Fist is for holding the floor. You want to say a piece and you don't want to be interrupted, but you also want the recognition from the people in the room. So it's like, I'm, I'm willing to wait for a little bit so I can really say my thing, right? Um, two fingers is like you have a quick reply. One finger is just you have a question. And by the way, people online, we've actually opened up the dialogue box, which wasn't up ever before. We've never used it before. So we see, for instance, that Mikey said, hey, and um, if you, this way, Simone, you don't have to hold your two fingers the whole time. You could just say two fingers and we'll, we'll, we'll know. Um, roles, I'm obviously the facilitator. My name is Dave Jonathan McCarricker. I've been facilitating um, for philosophy discussions for six years. I feel like I'm only beginning to really get the ha the handle of it. It's a very difficult task. I do appreciate your criticisms um, and, and uh, this is an ongoing thing. So please um, give me tips as we go along, preferably after, um, but yeah. Um, teachers and discussion leads um, currently are Tyler, Burt and Michael. Each one of them has uh, spent a, a great deal of time, if not with Hegel, then with continental philosophy, and will be throughout the course of this giving um, mini presentations between 20 and 45 minutes, um, usually probably 20 in the kind of like a leading discussion. Maybe they'll come with questions. Maybe they'll have a specific set of paragraphs picked out that they'll want to kind of unpack with everybody. And that this is not isolated to them, that others as well are definitely welcome to be a part of that as well. So you can have your name added to this list. Right, we don't have someone leading next week right now. Um, I think that's good enough for now. There, there are the two tracks we talked about that enough in the messenger group. I think um, on the on the topic though of the the difficulty of of of, of this endeavor um, when we talked about struggling through this text and and all of that, I actually w I wanted to just touch on a couple of quotes. So we'll uh, turn to, if you have the book, um, page 43. I'm going to be just jumping around. I kind of just drew a thread of where, wherever Hegel's talking about how hard real philosophy should be. So on 43, uh, last paragraph, uh, 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 the last third of the last paragraph, paragraph 70, True thoughts and scientific insight are only to be won through the labor of the notion. What is the notion you ask? Well, that, that should be one of the first things we'll be talking about. Um, page 41. Um, paragraph 67 at the point where it begins with in the case of, which is about a third of the way down, 67. In the case of all other sciences, arts, skills, and crafts, everyone is convinced that a complex and laborious program of learning and practice is necessary for competence. Yet when it comes to philosophy, there seems to be a currently prevailing prejudice to the effect that, although not everyone has eyes and fingers and, it, and is given leather, what? And is given leather and last, is that once in a position to make shoes, everyone nevertheless immediately understands how to philosophize and how to evaluate philosophy since they possess the criterion for doing so in their natural reason, as if they did not likewise possess the measure for the shoe in their own foot. And you don't have to um, neutralize pronouns. I'll be doing that though too. I, I just, I've kind of just made a rule with these recently. Uh, maybe the last one, 39. Page 39 or paragraph 39? Page, oh, so paragraph 63 on page 39. Okay. Uh, 
it's just that point when he says, so much has to be read over and over before it can be understood. A complaint whose burden is presumed to be quite outrageous and if justified to admit of no defense. Um, Hegel, and then really quickly right afterwards, Nietzsche, we're, we're both very, very comfortable saying, you're going to have to read me more than once to really get much out of this. So um, I... At, at Boise State, I'm an adjunct. I, I do university foundations with freshmen who are coming in. The lead criticism of any work tends to be it's too difficult. But by the very nature of this one specifically, well, it's not a criticism. It's, well, maybe it is, but it's the name, not in the nature of this project. I like Hegel's basic assertion that, well, just because you don't get it doesn't mean it's wrong. Uh, I like how he's already covering his ass. I mean, I, I'm not... Right, no, funny. totally. Well, and that's right, right? So what is he doing in this preface? There is a lot of ass covering he's coming in and doing. So would anybody like to lead off on, on the kind of uh, this basic set of questions? What are the different types of movements in the preface? What kind of... And remember that the beginner track isn't even doing the preface until possibly after the book's over. But so right now, some people haven't even gone into it at all so so really what's he doing in the prep uh, can i maybe jump in on that one yeah yeah one of the things that i find very interesting especially on the very first paragraph is that he talks about how is it that one engages with the question of philosophical truth or what is a philosophical work proper right um and i guess one of the most interesting things that characterizes this work is that it has to give us a little bit of a way uh an instructor's manual on how to navigate it uh, which is interesting compared to something like, let's say, a simple paper in analytic philosophy. It tends to be point A to point B, right? This very straightforward direction that is, is kind of seeking in this approach. And one of the things that is very characteristic of Hegel, and we're going to come to see more and more, is uh, so that he uses detours or uh, this way of being puzzled or deceived by his thought as a point of vantage for uh, essentially pushing thought to its limits. Um, so. Yeah, one of the particular things that I find very interesting about this uh, this is that it characterizes the work of philosophy as not just going from point A to point B, but something that kind of falls into this image of the rabbit hole of philosophy. This uh, One of the things I find mostly used to describe Hegel is how he said that his work is literally this kind of spiraling uh, motion in, in, such a, in a certain way. So uh, one of the main things that, that we have to deal with the question, uh, and I think Dave already can address this, is how do we read a text? How do we read a difficult text? And how do we uh, read a text whose very structure is informed by the questioning it's partaking on? Uh, like recently, for example, I've been reading the Encyclopedia of Philosophy, one of Hegel's later works. And one of the things he mentions about philosophy as opposed to other sciences is that while other sciences have their objects already uh, ready and given at hand, uh, philosophy develops its object through its own motions, through its own development. So the interesting thing about philosophy in this case is how so that it is uh, in essentially charting on on marked territory in a sense. So it's not dealing with anything that's immediately given to it, or it uh, it takes whatever is immediate and realizes that it's not as immediate as it thought it was at first. Um, yeah. We've got a fist. I have a fist, but I'll okay. Uh, any 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 quick responses to that, or we'll go to the fists. Tyler. Yeah, so I just thought it would be helpful to take a moment to situate what the preface is and what it's trying to do within its immediate uh, historical context. So in 1807, uh, he was like sort of battling the publisher at the time that he was writing this. Uh, there was a risk that uh, he wasn't going to get the text done in time and that his friend was going to have to like foot the bill for all of the printing of the book. Uh, and so the, the preface is actually really hastily constructed after the rest of the book had already been finished. And there's very strong reason to believe that Hegel sort of changed his mind about what uh, the phenomenology of spirit was meant to accomplish midway through writing the book. And so... All of that's helpful to keep in mind when looking at the preface. It's also helpful to consider that Hegel at this point, I think is like 35 or something like that. 
and his younger friend Schelling, who he was roommates with, had a job at the University of Vienna for years at this point and was sort of the wunderkind or, you know, the prodigy of Germany at this time, philosophical prodigy. And so Hegel's hopes and dreams and aspirations are really tied up with the success of this book. And the preface is something that he tried to do as sort of minimal introduction to uh, his system and in particular how a system is different from Schelling's. Uh, there's a lot of barbs about formalism and stuff like that. Schelling was one of uh, Hegel's contemporaries. They're actually roommates uh, at seminary for a while. Uh, yeah. Uh, and so it's helpful to keep in mind all this stuff while you're reading uh, uh, the preface. And also to keep in mind that um, this is really the moment in the preface where Hegel has the most synoptic vision. Yeah, with Holder in as well, uh, where Hegel has like a really synoptic vision of what he anticipates his entire system as being. And so, uh, because this is at the end of the Phenomenology of Spirit and right before uh, it the next book that he would write, The Science of Logic. And people will sometimes refer to this as Hegel's first system. Uh, and so, really helpful to keep in mind that Hegel intends this to be a sort of introduction to a system as a whole. But paradoxically, at the very beginning of the preface, he's going to insist that no such sort of introductory material is really going to be all that helpful in the first place. And so I think it's worthwhile to think about, consider, why does Hegel write a preface? And like, why does he, so in addition to writing a preface, why does he then go on to say is the very first thing in the preface, that writing the preface is essentially useless, that it's not going to be helpful uh, for understanding what he's up to. I think keeping those things in mind as well as the historical background will help you kind of get a grip on what it is that Hegel's trying to do here. And Bert? Um, thanks, that's actually, that's actually a really helpful um, information. You won't have to make it look ha! zoomed in. Um, I, I always thought it was kind of funny, like the way that he starts off a little bit snarkily, and that's something I do when I'm writing things fast under pressure also. Um, it's just kind of like, why do I have to? Okay, here, I'm going to do it anyways, right? Um, I, I just wanted to comment on like what makes Hegel different than maybe a formalist or a structuralist or what, like what's the element in Hegel that differentiates him from other thinkers, um, especially other systematic thinkers. And I really do think, like Simone, you said, can you unzoom it in? I did. Take some more. Thanks. Um, <laughs> That's as far as, yeah. Uh, Simone, you said there's a certain fluidity to the text. Um, I think that just the title of that companion text by, um, oh God, what's his name? When you're reading. Oh, uh, Hippolyte? Hippolyte, yeah. Genesis and structure really says it all because it's like, well, not it all, but it seems to be about both structure and form plus natality and how things evolve and change, but also how the newness even comes into being. So it really is like the system is about recording movements of being or of thought, I mean. Um, in... And I think maybe part of the dizzying like movements of it is really just to show you this is how thought actually like moves and works and how it breaks out of old circularities or loops and or or um, binaries or whatever and doesn't. I mean, like, I really liked what he said in the introduction because that's what I read about um, about negation and like emptiness and how like you know a lot of times people take up this attitude of when you negate something in a system, then you just throw the whole thing into this void of empty, you know, this empty void, right? And you hold it in this like pure negation. You don't see how when you, or you don't do a negation in the sense that you're presenting the nothing that is constitutive of, of that system. And then you come, you, be, you beget something new when you do that. Like negation is the source of natality, which means newness, right? And 
maybe that's my bias because I am coming at this after steeping in a rent for a while and she really is concerned with natality so I'm seeing origins of her thought but so then we can push back against that I just think that's the difference between him and, and just to clarify the you, when you're saying natality it's really that's newness right uh natality means the condition of being born or of being birthed it's the condition of of birthing newness okay and then we're going to go to Bert for the fist but really quick to John yeah uh I I just to extend that the the image, one of the first images from the preface with the bud going to the flower to the fruit, yes. is like you can you can dispense with these things because clearly this is not the true thing, this is not the true thing, this is not the true thing. But but something that would be more probing to the organic whole or the thing that's actually being viewed is to see them as necessary stages for each other. Mm -hmm. That don't even though the bud is gonna disappear completely when the flower comes. The flower is going to disappear when the fruit comes, and then you know there are stages after fruit that aren't even mentioned or, or seen. Seeing them as things that dispense with the past may not be the best way, or isn't for Hegel isn't the best way to see it. Right. I think the reason that I think the way Hegel actually opens up the phenomenology is profound. Um, he doesn't like a preface because he doesn't think philosophy can be summed up into a, a skeleton of little bullet points that has dead skin wrapped around it. And you go, there's life. He hated that. You don't, you don't have bullet points. You do philosophy. And that's what he does for 500 pages. And he's not going to sum it up into... Um, he's not going to start with I am and logically deduce everything else. He is going to go into the real world, start with ordinary consciousness, and show how that is incapable of achieving the truth it intends to achieve, and with all the other shapes of consciousness. And uh, I think he is trying to uh, do philosophy by denying what other people think philosophy is. And when it comes to his good old best friend Schelling, um, I uh, you know Schelling had been the Wonder Boy. <laughs> I guess Hegel had like I don't know if there's a personal thing to it, but the the barbs and everything today when I was reading it for the third time, I thought you know. He loves Schelling. This is tough love. He's Schelling is so far gone from where he should be. It's like Hegel is saying, come over to the side of negativity. <laughs> Luke Schelling. But he, uh, honestly, I think, uh, I just found myself, I don't think I've ever laughed at a philosophy the way I've laughed. At the things in the spot. And you're on your third read, or did you actually read it all the way through on the third? I I read the first half of the preface three times and the second half only twice. The second half didn't bring me to tears, like the first half, so my guess is I missed something. But I found it's poetry in a lot of ways. So we're gonna switch over to Robert, who's got a quick, but actually Simone. As we said, Robert. Uh yeah, do you want me to go first? Yeah. Okay, so my comment was really something uh, in response to Sammy, uh, particularly in dealing with the question of how is it that Hegel, for example, we see that he doesn't quite pick formalism or like focusing on content as any one way of starting his philosophy. Uh, one of the comments that has been brought up so far, and I think this is where the burden of this text is kind of upon us, is where do we start? <laughs> uh, Hegel is literally teasing us a little bit with uh, the problem of where do we start this text? This preface is inadequate. The starting point is in some ways inadequate. We can always pick a different starting point and that in some way shapes the inquiry to some extent. So if we take the case of formalism or focusing on content, for example, if we pick content as the starting point of our inquiry, that already determines what the given forms of consciousness may take. But um, Or uh, when we're focusing on the form itself, it also determines what kind of content will fit in it. Uh, so one of the things I find interesting in Hegel is how I said that uh, there's this dynamic between form and content where the form or shape that consciousness takes on at any one moment is in part 
changed by whatever contents come forward, whatever contents start being this kind of threshold of what a given shape of consciousness can take. So just to give an example that we'll see later on in the text, we move on from a natural consciousness of immediate sense experience that starts moving on to uh, reason and understanding at some point or another too. Uh, so I, I think one of the main things we'll see in Hegel is teasing, this teasing of limits of what uh, what may be figures of thinkability. What is it that is uh, given to uh, thought or the shape of thought and how is it that it will continue to change? Um, so in this sense, uh, the formulation for it would be how is it that I can think the other? What, uh, how can I think something that is radically distinct from myself uh, mm -hmm. in any one form that it take, uh, myself takes? Awesome. And so uh, I know Tyler and I think Michael both came with a, at least a couple of points prepared, uh, including paragraphs, perhaps that we'll be diving into. If not, it's okay, to, uh, guys, we'll just, uh, I've got backup plans, but um, really quick, though. I, I was actually trying to signal this, but I didn't quite know how I was going to change it to a fist. If oh, don't, good yeah, that. yeah. Okay. Um, because it just, you guys all brought up some amazing things and I kind of want to uh, bring that together. And I I just really think that, um, you know, Bert kind of said that Hegel doesn't really like prefaces because he, he doesn't think that philosophy should be. Um, but I, I I think that that's true. I think Hegel really, I, I think I would very much imagine that he, either Hegel's publisher or Schelling, Hegel probably said, how do I write a preface? And they basically responded to him, oh, j just give us a quick summary of what you're doing here. And Hegel just looked at him like, really? <laughs> but, but I think he really does see the preface as something important. And I, I think that's why you can't necessarily skip it while reading Hegel. Um, and I think what he's trying to do here is honestly, I think his preface is kind of his oh shit moment where he like, he realizes what he's written and just the scope and magnitude of it. And I think he always had this idea going through the text, but I, I just see this in the, um, preface where he's really trying to say like here's how you can maybe understand what i'm doing and here's like here's some of the thought that led me to where i am and here's me doing my best to give the reader a way to get into what i've just written because i think that he really does realize that what he's written is very hard and i think of course that was partly his goal but I think in the preface, he's really kind of, I don't want to say trying to take it easy on the reader, because even the press of preface is dense and hard and at times painful. Um, but I think he's really trying to say, like, this is the work you're going to be dealing with. Here's how I want you to think of it. Here's what I'm trying to think of. I'm not trying to give you some... Uh, you know, some quick tips for reading it. I'm not trying to give you a um, quick summary, but I'm damn well trying to make sure you can read it. And you know, I'm not doing this just to punish you. Like, we cool reader, I think is kind of the genesis of the preface. Awesome. The map is not the territory. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, and, and this is a perfect tie-in to, we'll be talking all... all I don't want to say semester, but like for the entire for the entirety of this project, one of the questions is what is his theory of truth? How does his theory of truth relate to consciousness and being and the unfolding of spirit? You know, and and one of the one of one of the things that you might have noticed is that one of his problems with the way that science and and we are using science in a in a in an older way where it's really like rigorously systematized, so you can follow what someone's saying. It's not it's not the typical kind of natural science that we think of now. But, you know, so, the, you know, sociology would count as a science here, right? Uh, or history. Um, he, he really, he, the thing is, is like what, when you say, oh, two plus two equals four, and then we all just know this by rote or whatever, he uses a bunch of examples from geometry and other, other things. But the basic idea is that, you know, we get that conclusion and we think that that's knowledge. But that what he's talking about as spirit and, and as science is this, um, is the process itself, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. It's just like uh, for Hegel, this book is a journey. It's not. It's not like you summarize the end. Uh, you don't get from 
if you start in New York City and end in San Francisco, you say, well, San Francisco is the meaning. No, you missed everything in between. And you actually have to live. You have to live through Emily Dickinson and Walt Whitman. You have to go to Niagara. You have to go to the stockyards in Chicago. You have to be at Wounded Knee. You get all, and then you know what it's like to be in San Francisco. And uh, I just can't believe that there's a philosopher with this much passion. Anyway. I want to tr tie this right back to paragraph 19, page 10. You read my mind. Dude. Really? Yeah. So before we get into this paragraph, can I kind of pose a couple questions? Yeah. Because I was literally going to jump in and talk about this. Moment. Yeah. Precisely because... Um, so I really want to talk about this sort of distinction between the things that are in itself, which comes up in, in 19, and then in and for itself, which is different, right? What that differentiation is, like, I think I kind of get it as, like, one is static and one is moving and dynamic, right? And 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 how that relates to the idea that essence is, form, which is a different paragraph. But so if we could parse through paragraph 19, I think that'd be really helpful because those are concepts that I feel that are going to be really important for me and probably for everybody going forward that I have just a really tenuous grasp on and would like to solidify a lot more like why it is that um, the the sort of static in itself and only for itself um, how would I put it is is more troubled than the in and for itself right that the, the the truth it's for itself like that gets at what the truth is that he's trying to to answer so and Tyler I don't know if this is okay with you but we could use this as a launch pad into um, maybe you'll be able to talk a little bit about how this was you know Kantian and, and Fichtian you know but and kind of like how those words are being used here but let's let's go ahead and read through it once allowed and you know we were talking about strategies for for making uh, these discussions a lot more text oriented than previous ones that we've done um, everyone's doing fantastic right now, but the, but the part of the idea is like reading a whole paragraph out loud, discussing it, and then reading it again, right? One of the things about continental philosophy is just like that glimmer of understanding that can, yeah, as, as it starts to make sense, is probably the most addicting part of the process itself. So we're gonna, I'll do it if you want. Thus the life of God and divine cognition may well be spoken of as a disporting of love with itself. But this idea sinks into mere edification and even insipidity. If it lacks the seriousness, the suffering, the patience, and the labor of the negative. In itself, that life is indeed one of untroubled equality and unity with itself for which otherness and alienation and the overcoming of alienation are not serious matters. But this in itself is abstract universality in which the nature of the divine life to be for itself and so to the self-movement of the form are altogether left out of account. If the form is declared to be the same as the essence, then it is ipso facto a mistake to suppose that cognition can be satisfied with the in itself or the essence, but can get along without the form, that the absolute principle or absolute intuition makes the working out of the former or the development of the latter superfluous, just because the form is as essential to the essence as the essence is to itself, the divine essence is not to be conceived and expressed merely as essence, i.e. as immediate substance or pure self-contemplation of the divine, but likewise as form, and in the whole wealth of the developed form. Only then is it conceived and expressed as an actuality. Jacob? Yeah, so this has something to do with uh, what I wanted to talk about with my fist. Uh, but I'm wondering how much Spinoza plays in here with Spinoza's notion of substance. Um, and I'm thinking 
particularly paragraph 17 and 18, which flow into 19, um, where there seems to be an inversion of Spinoza, because Spinoza is like there's no negativity in Spinoza um, within being, but here the there is negativity, but it doesn't actually seem like to contradict Spinoza. It's just Hegel's putting... Cause, it's wrong to say that there isn't negativity in Spinoza. There is negativity, but the driving force in Spinoza is always affirmation, uh, whereas in Hegel it seems to be negativity. Um, so I'm just I'm kind of just wondering um, where Spinoza plays in here because he he seems to be talking about substance and the absolute as very similar sort of concepts. So I'm wondering how Spinoza's understanding of being plays in here. And really quick, John said, uh, I, I just am not very familiar with Spinoza. And so if there's like a thumbnail or some sort of rough sketch of substance and in, in being in Spinoza, that would be really helpful for me because it's something that comes up a lot. People talk about Spinoza. Hey, yeah. Danny, I could say a little bit about Spinoza and Hegel here. Yeah, please do. All right. So, what we have, and again, I'm not sure how to exactly answer what the question Jacob was posing, but just to give us some context here, Spinoza was really influential on Hegel, and that's important because Kant and Fichte had kind of written off Spinoza, and <clears throat> with Schelling, Hegel, they started to see this, the importance of Spinoza, and really the one of the key fundamental insights that Spinoza had is that the two categories of transcendence and infinity are ultimately incompatible with each other, right? Well, traditional monotheism always says that God is both transcendent, he's outside of nature, he's outside the realm of the finite, but at the same time, he's infinite everywhere, all-encompassing. Well, Spinoza was a philosopher who pointed out, well, this is incompatible, right? Because if you're all-encompassing, if you're infinite, then there is no boundary for you between you and this finite realm. And so Spinoza is the one who pointed out this kind of contradiction. And this was really influential on Hegel. And so this, this kind of distinction, um, the way to approach it is to say, look, really what we call infinite, what we call finite is really just part of the infinite. What we call universal and what we call particular are really just a, a distinction within the universal itself. And so this is one of these aspects where <clears throat> Spinoza is influencing Hegel. And I think this type of issue that Hegel and Spinoza have with the, the idea of transcendence is actually part of the, the preface itself. I think one of the reasons Hegel has an issue with the preface is because it puts us in a position like we're outside of the philosophy. We're outside of the thinking of the absolute, when in fact thought is always internal to itself. And so there's a kind of way in which the very notion of a preface or an introduction reaffirms the metaphysics of transcendence. And so that's a kind of problematic aspect of the preface. But Ultimately, I just wanted to highlight that I think that Spinoza plays a huge part in the book insofar as his influence is in showing the problematic relation between the infinite and the transcendent. And Hegel, of course, in the Science of Logic, he, he talks about the two types of infinity. There's the spurious bad infinity, which is the false infinity, the, the idea that the infinite is that which transcends the finite. And then there's the, the the true infinite, which is the finite within the infinite itself that collapses the very distinction of immanence and transcendence. And so Spinoza's uh, philosophy of immanence is really important here. It's in the background. Dave, you're muted. So Tyler's been been sitting on this for for a minute, and I think he's ready to like because there a lot of questions came up on that last paragraph, and we're still on that. So there's a couple of fits, but we'll we'll come to those in a minute here. So thank you. Yep. 
Yeah, so I think just I was trying to kind of tie together a number of themes that come up in uh, paragraph 19, as well as some of the earlier concerns or uh, interests that we had in the theme about negativity and how Hegel distinguishes himself from uh, formalist uh, philosophers. Uh, and so I wanted to point out uh, uh, an earlier passage that I think will help us at 19, which is the beginning of paragraph five, which is on page three of the Miller. It just starts out, and I'll just do the first sentence, since I think that's what's important for us at this moment, uh, with the quote, the true shape in which truth exists can only be the scientific system of such truth. Um, so uh, this is a really striking claim, especially in continental philosophy, where we're used to uh, various kinds of suspicions, uh, both about scientific investigation, as well as about uh, systematic philosophy. But the point that Hegel, I, as I interpret him, is trying to make here is that philosophy, uh, or the, and he immediately talks afterwards about moving from just the love of wisdom to actual wisdom, uh, you know, philo Sophia to just wisdom Sophia. Uh, and he takes himself to basically accomplish this by the end of uh, the phenomenology of spirit. Here's the closest thing you'll get to the idea that Hegel says that philosophy is over or something like that. He didn't really believe that. Um, this is the only thing that's close to textual evidence for that claim. But uh, so the point that Hegel is trying to make here is that the nature of truth is such that isolated propositions that stand independent of one another don't really capture what the nature of truth is. And so he makes an earlier metaphor to anatomy and the like. That anatomy doesn't get at the truth of life, it just sort of takes, takes uh, the individual constituent components. Uh, and he, Hegel is really committed to a basically Aristotelian view that like a hand is only your hand insofar as it's part of your body. You like lob off a hand and it doesn't play the same functional role that it does in a whole, right? Now it's just a, a lobbed off limb. Uh, and so when Hegel emphasizes the importance of uh, systematicity and scientific uh, unfolding of truth, what he's really trying to get at is the way in which it has to be a necessary, imminent development, which also ties back to an earlier theme that uh, was brought up, I believe, by Sammy about the relationship between uh, negativity and newness or natality. Uh, and I think that a, a phrase that Hegel often uses is really helpful here, and that phrase is imminent development. Uh, mm -hmm. So by imminent, Hegel means, as uh, Michael was just saying, that it's not the result of something from outside the, the system or something like that that compels it towards its own activity. It's instead spurred onwards by its own lights. It's in imminent uh, development, something necessary uh, for that thing to be the, the thing that it is. Um, and so the way that uh, a, con a concept that Hegel utilizes, talks a lot, uh, called determinate negation refers to the way in which the self-contradictions of a singular thing force it into the next uh, figure of consciousness. And so when we talk about sense certainty, what we're going to see is that sense certainty has a certain self-understanding. It's then fundamentally unable to account for the truth based on its own self-understanding. And this forces it into... Um, a movement into a different form of consciousness. Now we need a new theory of truth because this theory of truth was fundamentally inadequate at what it was uh, meant to accomplish. And so Hegel's criticism of uh, various kinds of formalism as well as the idea of practices and philosophical works is that these aren't really imminent developments. They're not coming from within uh, the necessary confines of that system. Instead, they're externally given, which I think that, uh, yeah, the paragraph 19 uh, 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 refers to. Um, when Hegel talks about for itself in this sort of context, what he's talking about is that very process of 
illuminate development that accompanies any and every uh, a form of consciousness that we're going to talk about in the phenomenology of spirit. Um, and so I think that in if you want to just very briefly uh, to bring in Spinoza again, Spinoza, if you ever uh, want to have the experience of reading Spinoza, it's meant to be like Euclid. It's meant to be like uh, you know, there are propositions and then there are corollaries and then you move from one step to the next, et cetera, et cetera. What Hegel thinks is ultimately lacking, while he very much likes the systematicity of uh, what Spinoza is up to, for Hegel, this appears just completely artificial, right? And what he means by formal in this sense is that the transition from one proposition to another just comes from like a definition that Spinoza just happens to insert or something like that. It's not a necessary feature of what was said previously that you have to move on uh, to the next proposition and, and stuff like that. And so this is kind of what Hegel is getting at, I think, in paragraph 19, where he talks about uh, moving from the simple in itself of abstract universality uh, to being in and for itself, which is to be able to account for this necessary imminent development of any and all philosophical systems, the imminent development of the truth, which we normally think of as something which doesn't develop, which is just sort of static and the same all the time or something like that. I think, um, well, Dave's stepped away. I think Simone had the finger and then Rob. Um, honestly, I was just going to point out the passage that just got pointed out, the one about the true shape of truth. Uh, so honestly, you can just move on along. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think Stanley also beat me to the fist, so. Uh -oh. um. Yeah, regarding, I think it was regarding paragraph 19. That was really good, Tyler, so you kind of distracted me from my, from my own thought. Um, well, was, really, oh, is it still, what you're, you're on paragraph 19 about this, or? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, but someone else can go first, because it'll take me a minute to recover. Well, just the, the, the two thoughts that bookend 19 is, is helpful for, for my understanding of it, which is uh, the end of 18, it is the process of its own becoming the circle that presupposes its end as its goal, having its end also as its beginning, and only by being worked out to its end is it actual, which is the, the actuality of the in itself, which he's saying um, here when it's like the life of God, you know, you can treat the it itself as if it's something that doesn't have these sort of problems or these this process of negation happening in it but um it's actually in that process that something becomes and something becomes actual and then at the at the beginning of 20 the true is the whole but the whole is nothing other than the essence consummating itself through its development so you can look at the in itself and you can treat it as if it's some sort of static thing but um but from what I understand of those points that are sort of passing through that paragraph, it, trying to make it really clear that even a thing that you might treat as its own static thing is a part of this process. That's the only way it becomes actual is by sort of consummating, making itself into being by this process. That was really good. Yeah. Uh, and, and by the way, yeah, um, um, unless people are kind of piling up, we don't even use the hand signals. That, that is the other part. So everyone's doing a great job with it, but also you can just interject it when, when there's not an actual cue going on. So, hey Dave, just to kind of piggyback off of what Tyler said, you know, it is important to emphasize the role of determinate negation, right? I mean, in a weird sense, the the determinant in that is it's what gives the negation a kind of positive charge, right? Because when one of the shapes of consciousness runs in one of these deadlocks that negates it, it's the very fact that this negation is not just a flat out negation. The negation comes from the very structure of the shape of consciousness itself. And in doing so, it itself as a negation leads structurally in another direction. So like what Tyler was saying, it's not that you just, oh, uh, since certainty negates itself, well, let's try perception. It's that there's an actual kind of positive inferential link between the two. And, and so on the one hand, yeah, the dialectics, rests highly on this moment of negativity, but it's also 
you know, we, we want to just use the term synthesis here, but again, that triad is misleading. But if, if there's any role for synthesis, it's just the fact that the negation is determinate and it has a type of directedness to it, a type of structure to it, not a flat out negation. And the negation itself is limited in what comes out of it. And that's what gives form to the next moment. What's an example between negativity, like what you were kind of saying, like plain negativity and determinate negativity i'm not sure tyler you would have to jump in here but i'm not sure if there's a moment of just pure negativity in hegel i mean i don't know if the closest moment we come to it is in the first opening dialectic of science of logic where you have being and then nothing but the 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 quote you know or the, you know the synthesis if we want to talk like that of being and nothing in the science of logic is determinate being Right, which you, I don't know if it's a stretch to connect determinate being to determinate negation, but determination is right there as the the third step in the science of logic, and so you know if you if starting with the phenomenology, you start with sense consciousness, you've already have a kind of determinate aspect to consciousness insofar as it's sense certainty, and so when that negation kicks in, that's intrinsic to sense certainty. It has a determinant, it, it determines the path that comes next, the step that comes next, right? It's not just a, a brute negation. It's not like uh, the idea of somebody getting murdered. They're just, it, you kill them, it's over, it's the end. It's that this negation is positively, positively charged based on the fact that it itself is determinate. Really quickly, can we just get a definition for determinant um, as it's here because well i mean that it I, comes out of, you know it's it really comes out of that that line from spinoza it's himself in one of the letters he wrote all determination is negation right it's the idea that you can take just a simple example if the basketball is orange that means it's not blue it's uh, not red yeah it's not purple it's the whole it, it's the derrida every uh, definition is an incision or whatever thing it's a specific thing. Right. That yeah. Boundaries. That's yeah. Away from the and else. from, because when I was reading Hegel today, he said the eye is the source of negativity. For there to be an eye, there's got to be something else. So, so basically, uh, there can't be an eye without a, neg a negation that says, the eye is not that. And uh... yeah, so one sort of hotly contested textual question with the phenomenology of spirit is so Hegel will usually contrast the idea of an abstract negation and a determinate negation. So um, you know, as we were just saying, a determinate negation implies some bound or limit, and that's what determines it is that particular thing. And Hegel wants to talk about what is the structure of having any sort of determinate object whatsoever. And um, for those of you who are interested in the German ideals tradition in general, you might see the Kantian categories as being akin to the necessary features for anything to be a determinate object whatsoever. So Hegel is sort of taking up that project uh, in in talking about determinate negation and asking what are the determinate features for anything to be that thing at all. Um, and so the problems uh, with one figure of consciousness will lead to a determinate, as Michael was saying, if there's a specific next mode of consciousness. It's not uh, I disagree with people that say that like, oh, the phenomenology or the science of logic, like you could splice that up and put it in any order that you like. I think that that's false. I think that there's a reason for why uh, both books are in the order that they are in, is that one problem necessarily leads to the next one encompassed, or at least that's Hegel's intention, uh, whether or not you ultimately agree with him. Um, 
And so what one question that you might ask, one thing that you might keep in mind is you're reading the phenomenology of spirit is the question, is there an abstract negation in the phenomenology of spirit? Which means, is there some path that Hegel doesn't uh, uh, go on because he can't, right? Because there's nothing there to do uh, that leads off of the path of the phenomenology of spirit into nothing at all. Um, I would argue that there's at least one that happens in the phenomenology of spirit for, this is going a little bit ahead for people that haven't read, but in the master slave or Lord Bondsman passage, uh, Hegel describes one way in which uh, this relationship could happen and that's just with them killing each other. And that's it. <laughs> then you're done. There's nothing, there's nothing more to do, right? Consciousness doesn't have any, any further path from that, right? Um, and Abel, I think, would point out that tons of societies have had uh, uh, sorts of conflicts that just lead ultimately to a dead end. Uh, and so the question of abstract negation is something like, is there a dead end in the phenomenology of spirit? And where is it? And, you know, some thinkers would think that that kind of dead end might be more interesting than the path that uh, Hegel chooses to embark on. I think that you... Uh, people that read Hegel this way that would be the most interesting for us are Bataille and the early Derrida uh, try to take up this question. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, so may I interject or is there anyone in the group over there who is wanting to talk? I, I, okay, so I think I think Jacob has one finger, Sammy's got one finger. Um, you. Uh, so we've got we've got three people with quick questions. I just want to say for for a matter of like order, there's a half hour remaining, and and then we'll close it out. But there'll be like a a short five minute like uh, here's what's coming up next time and and like uh, stuff like that. So okay, uh, we'll just go. Uh, I can go. Well, I, I yeah. just literally terms because um, this is why I have a hard time with math. The same same problem with Hegel, same problem with math. It's just like okay, slow down. Like what are you know? I like tracking the terms, and I know like to some extent you have to let go of that. But okay, so now I get what determinate negation is. Abstract negation is that like in the introduction when Hegel was talking about when people kind of throw out the whole thing into this empty void. Yes. Okay. I just wanted to clarify. That's what that meant. Okay. Probably a quick question. I don't know how quick the answer is. Um, so, I, I mean, I understand the importance of the negation and how um, the sort of in itself doesn't have that possibility. Um, but I'm under. I'm not sure what the for itself is like. What there's a difference there, but I'm not sure. Like by adding just the language to be for itself, what's that doing? Right? Like, how is that? And then it, it follows it with this, like this idea of self movement. Like I understand the idea that the truth is the self moving thing. But I don't understand how that's happening and how it's related to negation necessarily. And if and but it's they're so close together, and I just can't make that connection. Um, but it seems central to to understanding this whole thing to me. So, so and this is is it in seventeen? And I think it's, we're gonna go Simone Tyler on yeah. on the longer replies. Uh, oh, and Michael's got another question too. Really, it, it cause the nice thing about lining up a bunch of questions is that whoever takes the floor next can usually like hit on a bunch of them. So, yeah, I already yeah, figured out I can dodge them. Not you brought up. So, anyways, anyways. Did Michael want to just ask his, and then we can go for it, Michael. Okay, no, okay. I, you know, I, Tyler, I just wanted to ask. Yes. Is there any way that we could basically say that abstract negation and determinate negation in some rough sense correspond one, uh, abstract negation to understanding and determinate negation to reason with abstract negation being, it seems very compatible with the whole idea of bivalent logic and either or uh, the law of identity, law of non-contradiction, law of excluded middle, and that determinate negation is what in a sense, allows us to blur the lines of the categories of understanding. I'm not sure if the you know Hegel ever makes that connection. Just curious. Smug. 
Lovely. Um, I find it pretty interesting you mentioned this question of uh, blurring the lines of uh, how is it that we do judgments like uh, the law of non-contradiction and whatnot, because I find this a uh, lot in Lacan, actually. But I digress. I, I think my comments tend to be coming more from the point of view of uh, what happens when you encounter someone that doesn't regularly do philosophy. Um, and I think this has helped me understand what Hegel means by negation, because ultimately Hegel's project is a science of the concrete. Um, so when I think of negation, I find this way of sharpening the concrete, almost as if, if I were sharpening a knife, giving it shape, giving it form, determining it. Uh, so what I found when I tried to think through this question of determinate negation, I tried to think about it in this kind of weird inversion. Usually when we come across someone who doesn't regularly do does philosophy, they think of philosophy as a highly abstract subject matter, right? Like sometimes people will be like, what the fuck are you thinking about? How is it that you ended up in this kind of situation thinking this far out thoughts? But the curious thing about Hegel is that he points out that uh, what is most immediate to common cognition is actually quite abstract. It's not as immediate or as uh, pure as it may think it is. So I find that when we're engaging with this question of determinate uh, negation, we're dealing with this way of giving form, this way of sh uh, shaping or making more concrete or inquiry. Uh, I, th I think kind of answers some of the questions that got brought up. And I think the last comment I have to do is this question that alludes to the Derrida-Dayan concern, that is Hegel merely this returning to the same thing, or can we actually touch across anything radically other than what, the, uh, what is in the immanence of the phenomenological consciousness? Uh, those are my comments. Okay, uh, so I'll do my best to try to weave together uh, some elements from some of these questions. So the first question dealt with the relationship between various terms that Halo uses, uh, the for itself, for self-movement, negativity, um, how are all these terms being used, how do they relate to one another? Um, so the first thing that I would say is that I would argue that it's not very helpful to have like a sort of master definition for these sort of phrases that Hegel is using, like in itself, for itself. And then you can just have that one definition and then that will track each one of his uses. These are kind of uh, fairly common German phrases. Um, and so like Hegel, this isn't exactly philosophical. It, it's kind of, uh, he's trying to utilize some elements of natural language and then imbue it with some new philosophical meaning, right? And so it's not going to correctly track one exact definition throughout the entirety of the book. And I think that having some level of confusion over Hegel's terminology and what he's doing here is perfectly appropriate, given that he says that, like, you're not, you're, it's simply not going to be completely clear by reading the practice. Um, so those are things that I would uh, say initially, but uh, more in depth, I think that the relationship between these concepts is it's helpful to think about, so think, uh, the way that I think about this problem is I think about the way that philosophical systems develop. And I think about that because I think about philosophy a lot. But you can take virtually any sort of domain and it'll, uh, or, or it'll have the same structure basically, right? And so um, one example is that Hume points out a skeptical problem with our ability to understand cause and effect, right? Um, take that for granted. That is a kind of negativity. He's pointing out a way in which our current body of knowledge is unable to account for something it ostensibly can account for, right? Like we do natural science. We talk about relationship between cause and effect all the time, right? Um, and so in a way, uh, what Hume is pointing out is a sort of lack in our current understanding, despite the fact that we apparently utilize these terms all the time. Then you can think about philosophical development as Kant is attempting to respond to this kind of skeptical problem. And arguably, I mean, he says himself in the whole dogmatic slumber line, all that kind of stuff, he develops his own philosophical system as a response to the sort of problems that Hume pointed out with necessary connection, right? And so here what you have is an example of a sort of negativity, a lack, a problem, which engenders or produces a very determinate positive result. 
And in particular, we move from the problem, the causality that Hume points out to the actual solution of the uh, Kantian system, right? Part of what Hegel is trying to point out is that we need to move beyond uh, what I'll call the understanding, which is sort of to take a dichotomous opposition and to think of them as fully distinct from one another. They have no overlap whatsoever. Things are either true or they're false, or things are infinite or they're finite, right? And Hegel wants to show how actually truth develops through an encounter with the false, or a truth develops through uh, a system of philosophy where everything's sort of one-sided, right? And it's only in, as he says, the scientific system where you can understand how it is that this, how it is that we engender these problems and move towards certain solutions that we're really going to arrive at a robust understanding of truth. Uh, and so this kind of leads into the next question was on the relationship between the understanding and reason. These are sort of shorthand words that Hegel uses to refer to uh, styles of thinking. Which words? Sorry? Oh, which words? Uh, understanding and reason. Okay. So the understanding is caught up in these sort of dichotomous oppositions. And by dichotomous, I mean that they're two term relations that don't overlap in any way whatsoever, right? And some of the examples I gave before, like truth and falsity, right? If something is true, it's absolutely true. And there's no way that it's false in any way whatsoever, right? And similarly, with the false with respect to the true. Uh, another example would be the infinite and the finite, right? To be infinite is not to be the sort of finite things that we are, right? Normally, we think of these as dichotomous oppositions. Uh, and that's how Hegel characterizes the understanding. Part of the goal is to transition from the understanding to reason. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and reason is a way of re-understanding, re-articulating these previously dichotomous oppositions to show sort of their mutual integration, to blur the boundaries, to show the way in which, as Michael was saying, the finite is a moment of the infinite itself. Uh, to show that we can't just think of these as dichotomous, as fully opposed to one another, but how they necessarily have to intermingle within each other in uh, some very determinate way. And that's kind of vague because we don't have a pair of terms that we're working with or one uh, specific moment in the phenomenology. So as Hegel says in the preface, you kind of just have to take my word for it at this point. Um, but that, in general, is what Hegel is going to be trying to do. And I think that, Michael, you're right in pointing to the way in which um, if you think that, like, there's just Hume and there's just Kant, right, and you don't see it as a process in which they envelop or the history of philosophy envelops with them together, then you're not likely to see the way in which we, the history of philosophy moves from one figure to the next. And you're not likely to arrive at uh, what Hegel calls a standpoint of reason or something like that. You could probably talk more about how those are Kantian words and how he uses them and stuff like that, but I don't think that's important here. Um, yeah. And so the last question was related to the idea of non-philosophical consciousness and radical alterity or the idea that is there just something, some kernel that uh, resists integration into Hegel's system? Is there something that Hegel just finds himself radically unable to think or something like that? Uh, there are lots of philosophers who make these sorts of criticisms. The first one is actually Schelling, uh, who sort of initiates this sort of criticism. Schelling is one of those philosophers that has like a, a comeback. Uh, he like stops publishing around 1809 and then he replaces Hegel as the chair in Berlin in like the 1840s, and his goal was to stamp out the dragon seed of Hegelian pantheism. Uh, the Prussian government really did not like Hegel uh, for very good reasons, I would argue. Uh, but, uh, in any case, so what this criticism tries to say is that there's some radical otherness that resists sort of integration the system and perhaps this radical otherness is in some way the foundation of the entire system uh, that Hegel himself like 
comes really close to thinking about, but is just sort of fundamentally unable to do. Um, this is a criticism a lot of different philosophers make about Hegel. Um, I personally don't think it's very convincing. Here's why I don't think it's very convincing. If something is radically other, that is to say, other in every respect, uh, then I don't know how we can think about it. <laughs> you know, like even to say, and this is a Hegelian argument, even to say that something is other is already to have made a claim about its content, right? If I say that something is other than myself, then I'm saying something very, very specific. I'm contextualizing, argue, making an argument about the, in characterizing that thing that I just said resists all sorts of characterization, right? And it, it, so as a result, um, you know, the closest thing to this in Hegel's time was the thing in itself, which we're supposed to uh, think, be thinkable but not knowable, right? And Hegel says it's just the opposite, right? And Hegel says it's actually completely knowable because it's not thinkable at all. There's nothing to think about. And so you know everything that there is to know. There's no gap, no remainder. There's nothing that you're missing out on because you haven't given us a concept that we can even think, right? And... If that's the case, then Hegel's not missing anything. There's not, there's not some ineluctable something that is sort of outside of the purview of uh, Hegel's account. You might think about that sort of argument, whatever you want, but that is my position. I tend to, not, I tend to think that these criticisms are not very good. I think that better criticisms would be ones that uh, focus on particulars about Hegel's argument and point out particular things that Hegel is excluding. Like, for instance, uh, his basically wildly racist history or uh, history of Western civilization. I think there are very good criticisms to be made here. Right, but they're not just about some fundamentally non-cognitive, non-understandable other. They're about various particular societies and peoples that Hegel leaves out of his account of history, stuff like that. That would be my view, but you might think something different. So we've we've actually got a stack right now, and we've got about uh, seventeen minutes left, and so it's going to be Sammy and Bert and Jacob and Simone. Uh, their questions are already actually in the um, sidebar here, um, and and I think I think another there was also another one, and I would be happy to spend the entirety of the rest of this on three three particular passages having to do with how substance and subject are the same thing. That's which okay, you also want to do that, okay? But we'll we'll tie that back to that, and and honestly, we'll, we'll get to that when we get to it. But um, Sammy. Um. Uh. Okay, well, since there's so much, I'll just make this, like, I'll throw it out there as an idea. Um, but I kind of, I guess, not, I don't want to, like, push back against what you said, Tyler, because obviously I know Hegel and a lot of these preceding philosophers better than I do. Um, but I almost wonder if those good criticisms you're talking about, about the racism... Um, so what I've been thinking the whole time I've been reading this, which is not very long, is... Um, obviously, Hegel is, is careful to kind of cover his ass and say he's not he's not positing that any anything is historically necessary as in it's determined and must happen, right? Like, it's not, like, inevitable, but things unfold from within events or they are necessary and follow from one another, okay? So we're using necessary in that way. But when you, I, I wonder sometimes if, if arguing... That the so when we're talking just about a truth proposition or truth encountering the negative, it's easy to say this, but the minute you take it to history, it becomes incredibly difficult to say this sort of thing because you come face to face with the impact of violence and negativity on on the other, um, and so this is something that so so for instance, like arguing somehow that you know our own truth has become defined by its. I, I don't know, like, e even saying that it, it was imminently necessary for genocide and, and, and slavery to happen is, I think, one of those those places where you come up against something that isn't necessarily cognizable. Because when you come face-to-face -face with, with grief or with suffering or with, like, this, uh, this pain of, of another being... 
it's it's kind of leaves you at a loss, right? Like cognizing it isn't appropriate almost. And so, I mean, I know that there's lots of ways you can tie that into like Simone, some of your work or your thoughts on, on like Derrida and the archive and, and, and ghosts and remainders and all this sorts of, this sort of thing. But I, I, I yeah, I can see how there's a cheap criticism to say like, oh yeah, there's just some remainder and, and it can actually be used for even fascism or mysticism to be like, oh, there's always this thing that you'll never, you'll never quite get. I'm just saying maybe it's that violence of history. And, and some of these, because we are at this point, it's okay to leave some certain questions kind of on the table and we'll just keep revisiting these all. Well, just real quickly, um, I underlined this in orange instead of yellow, which means I'm really serious. <laughs> What's this? Uh, but Hegel Dude. says at the very beginning of paragraph 17, in my view, which can be justified only by the exposition of the system itself. So he thinks this is important enough to cheat and tell you about it rather than just hold you in suspense later in the text. Everything turns on grasping and expressing the true, not only as substance, but equally as subject. So then in 18, yes, a bit into it, he says, this substance is as subject pure, simple negativity. And it's for this very reason, the bifurcation of the simple. It is the doubling which sets up opposition and then again the negation of this indifferent diversity and of its antithesis, the immediate simplicity. Only this self-restoring sameness or this reflection in otherness within itself, not an original or immediate unity as such, is the truth. And you know, my, my, my rough and ready way of dealing with this, first of all, he says that spirit is the universal individual. So let's just go, you know, there's this shared, we have a shared set of assumptions about the way things work. And let's just, just play along and say that, you know, there is, that this does exist. Um, for me, um, I'm, I'm just going to psychologize this. She, just for me, I can't know myself. I can only be myself. I can only know something else. And so that's you. I look at you and I get clues about what I am. And I take, there's a doubling. I am doubled. I'm dealing with another. And um, and you bring that inside and you, uh, by the fact that you actually have something to know, you become a subject and you have negated, you have bifurcated, you have uh, taken a, a hole that is, uh, seamless, um, in this, you know, just a hole, and you've broken it in half, and that's negation. But anyway, I, uh, the fact that he says that, and you become subject that way, that substance is subject, and he says it's the most important thing. My guess is that we should follow this strand about what that means, and he says that it gets elaborated throughout the Right. Right. And so the, the whole, the subject and, and substance, um, um, thread is, is when I was, I was drawing on this, on this read and, and I, I was thinking like, so it is on page 10 in, in paragraphs, um, 17 and 18. It's also on page 21, paragraph 37. Substance shows itself to be essentially subject. It's also in 33, um, 54, paragraph 54. In general, because as we put it above, substance is in itself or implicitly subject. All content is its own reflection into itself. The substance or substance of anything that exists is 
its self identity. Hearing Bert just now, I think, is helping me a little bit with this, but I, I, I agree. It's something that we'll have to be watching how he's trying to elaborate that throughout the entirety of this process. I'm wondering if anybody else wants to kind of add on to the substance um, subject thing, though. There's a whole thing going on in the chat right now. Oh, and there's a whole thing going on in the chat right now. But before we get to the chat thing, anyone on the substance subject thing? I'll just say, I'll just say I, 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 I can't exactly, but I can, I can tell you that, that the last chapter of GGX Sublime Object of Ideology, it's called uh, not only a substance, but, oh well, let's see exactly, <clears throat> not only a substance, but also a subject. And so it tackles this, um, and, and it's the most Hegelian chapter in the whole book. And so <clears throat> I, I just finished reading it, and with you know my lack of understanding of Hegel is the hardest chapter in the book for me. But what I was able to get from it was really insightful. And so I do recommend if anybody feels like doing any uh, supplemental reading, give it, uh, give that chapter a look. Is chapter that the the blind object. object. Yes. Okay. Good. Well, and and maybe as you as you ma as you work on mastering that text, which I know you're doing a. Uh, a sort of a line-by-line -line analysis um, with the intent of us doing a seminar on that text next year. Um, yeah, maybe maybe keep thinking about that, you know, ways of articulating it. Examples, examples are awesome. And, and w w the, all these conversations about identity and, 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 neg and negativity and, and all these things. Uh, I'm going to jump ahead and start the line-by-line -line on that one. I'm going to skip some chapters, and since we're working on Hegel right now, it's a good time to work on that chapter, so see what yeah. I come up with. The, yes, the, yes. The issue with the substance and the subject <laughs> is helpful with 19, just with this problem of the in itself, the for itself, oh, yeah. and, and this idea of the, the abstract universality that this in itself is supposed to be, but that the system is, is complicating or, or is making right. not as simple as we would want to make the in itself to be. Well, so I would encourage everyone, when you're thinking about the substance, also a subject line. So this is probably the single most famous line in any table text ever. Uh, and so, like, the way that this was taken up in the Anglo-American tradition for a long time is, oh, Hegel is talking like there must be something like God that some like mega mind that is the subject or something like that. Uh, that's definitely false. That's uh, I don't think anyone here is suggesting that. But I just want to make sure ward off that as an interpretation of what's going on here. I think that the point is basically very Aristotelian. And Hegel's question is, and this is in some ways the question that Hegel always has in his mind: How did we get here? <laughs> How is it that? We can have the world that we inhabit produce the kinds of beings that we are, right? The kinds of beings that can reflectively ask the question about the nature of reality and about the nature of substance, right? And so to view substance also as subject is to keep in mind both the fact that we are subjects who exist within substance. We are, we are parts of substance that have become subject. And how is it that substance has the capacity to engender a knowing being at all? How does that ever happen? And Hegel wants to develop an account whereby we can have an accurate account of the metaphysics, even the physics, and the anthropology, the history that can produce the kinds of knowing subjects that we ourselves are. How it, Hegel, in a way, is trying to, it, the phenomenology of spirit in particular, but Hegel's work in general is always a way of taking stock. How is it that we got to the precise point where we are? And in a lot of ways, Hegel is trying to work this out in the phenomenology and the encyclopedia, which is his later project. It has a logic, and so Hegel's trying to figure out the metaphysics of how it is that there are knowing creatures in the world. 
he has a philosophy of nature, which is basically the physics as well as the biology of how it is that we can have the sorts of creatures that we are. And he has a philosophy of spirit or mind. And we have to talk, we'll talk a lot more later, I assume, about what that is, what Geist, which is spirit or mind, is. But the anthropology and the psychology of how it is that we can have knowing beings that can relate to sort of things uh, like the phenomenology, like uh, uh, the logic or the encyclopedia. And so this is why Hegel constantly characterizes his own projects as a kind of self-discovery. I wanted to throw in something um, on that as well, because I, I, I have like this sort of image, and I don't know if it's going to be counterproductive or not, right? But I was thinking about substance at, and the subjectivization process of the of the subject sort of becoming, uh, you know, coming into being or whatever. I was thinking about it in terms of like sedimentation, cultural sedimentation. And I'm not sure if that's all right, but it seems to kind of fit within this idea of like a progressive coming into truth, the unfolding, the imminent unfolding of, of spirit and consciousness. So it's on page 16, um, paragraph 28. At the bottom, the last, I'd say, quarter of this page, thus, as far as factual information is concerned, we find that what in former ages engaged the attention of people of mature mind has been reduced to the level of facts, exercises, and even games for children, right? And especially nowadays, we're learning that factory schooling doesn't work and that we really do want to try to use games for, for learning, right? And he says, in the child's progress through school, we shall recognize the history of the cultural development of the world traced, <coughs> as it were, in a silhouette. This past existence is the already acquired property of the universal spirit, which constitutes the substance of the individual and hence appears externally to them as their inorganic nature. Right. And, and I think like, this is something that we pick up on a lot more in you know, uh, uh, later philosophy, but like the idea that like that milieu, that, that cultural context, it, it, there's that sedimentation from previous periods all built up there and, 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 and it's, it constitutes your assumptions about what is normal or the normative matrix or, or normalcy, right? But whatever is normal and however you are vis-a-vis -vis normality is constituted by that milieu that's been unfolding over time. Yeah, and I think, I think this is a very good metaphor and I think it'll also help you understand what it means to move from substance to also subject is that Hegel would say that part of what is involved is recognizing that that history, that uh, sedimentation, et cetera, isn't something external to you, but is something that is part of who you are, right? It's not just something given to you. It's something that you take up in your own life history in choosing who you are, in adopting the interests that you do, et cetera. I think that this is a perfect metaphor for what Hegel describes as moving from substance where it's some bare positive facts that are external to you to subject where it becomes very constitutive of your very identity uh, uh, to take all that kind of stuff on. You know, a perfect example for my own life is that reading philosophy is almost always this discovery of like, oh, this idea has already been thought. This idea I thought was my own, right? And, and but oh, it's clearer now. Oh, it's better to find. Oh, I'm see, you know, so it's, and, and this is, uh, he does talk about the difference between internal and external in this sense, right? And that, and the, one of the reasons he wants science or systemizing knowledge is to be able to, sh he said that people deserve a ladder to get there, uh, you know, a step ladder to get to the point. You know, you don't just, you know, the guru comes along and, and says, oh, well, here is the profound, the profound truth, you know, where he's saying, no, we need, the steps to how you got there. So, yeah. Well, well, first of all, I was, I was just curious about the status of the queue. So the, the last thing basically is, is I, I realize that there's a conversation that happened in the sidebar. I don't know what of that needs to be brought in here. Um, would you like to ch comment on it or bring it in? And then we'll just closing thoughts and then I'll say a couple things about next week and we're done. Yeah. Um, well, I feel like I don't want to beat a dead horse, but, um, yeah, it, it's interesting to think about that cultural sedimentation and how 
there are there might be gaps that are literally sedimented into constituting us in a sense um or if you're even talking about soil like what had to die to make that soil sort of a thing right like mm -hmm. um and the history that is lost or the the things that are relegated to sort of the unconscious dustbin um i think the other cultures that are that are violently eradicated to the dustbin but I, I don't want to like seem like I'm just trying to take a hammer to Hegel about that. I just wanted to keep pointing that out to see like we can inco almost incorporate that into him while we're reading. Totally. Um, uh, so I, if, if I may interject on that point quickly, I find someone who does this pretty well is Francois Larule. Uh, who takes on the po uh, point of view of uh, dealing with this question of uh, the Hegelian all synthesizing sameness but also engaging with uh, figures of the radically other besides Hegel. And I think that's the key word, besides, which doesn't mean that we abandon Hegel, but that we start considering what is uh, running alongside or parallel to the figures of the thinkable. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank you. That's, that's good. Um, Lucas, did you want to say, I, I think you've got some interesting stuff there. Did you want to phrase it or are you? No, you're done. Okay. Stuff about the practice. All right. Um, is there is there any anyone want to say anything final before I put, like say the last things? No. Everyone's had their fill. Um, Michael sent us a quote. As as is typical, um, a lot of times the best conversations explode out of the structured part of the of a discussion. The, the, the best conversations happen around the fire pit, along the canal, here by the house, and, and they usually happen in groups of two to four. Um, and, 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 and really, I always kind of see a structured discussion like this one as a sort of exercise and yeah, we're all taking turns, having recognition in a sort of public environment where it's, you know, but the, we've all got lots of ideas that have built up here that we're gonna walk away with and maybe be talking about right outside around the fire or along the canal, but also the people online aren't able to join for that. And I do want to encourage people to friend with requests one another on Facebook. That's not weird. It is normal to try to add a little more life into your timeline. And, and so I just want to encourage people that and, and, and to encourage that everyone here should be, um, how to say this, They're, we're comrades and and that it, it, not just in this in the in the in the endeavor of reading this text, but in, in life itself, and and we're all pioneering new ways of, of being and and thinking through these things. And so I know that Sammy, for instance, um, will do a coffee and a and a chat with uh, Simone and Lucas or Simone or Lucas, and you know I call Michael from time to time. But I hope that everyone is going to take the next you know thirteen weeks as an opportunity to develop relationships with people. You don't already know here um, whether they are in Detroit like Jacob or in Alberta like Simone and Lucas or Tyler where are you <laughs> I don't even know I'm in West Lafayette. yeah I yeah I'm in West Lafayette Indiana and the, the only last thing I was gonna say was I was going to say hey uh, let's spend a minute just going over people's responses on this survey, but we're not going to because we're at time. And um, I think there's a lot of really, really, really useful stuff for norming a group in there, which is why I kind of wanted to read off some major points there. But I think it would be better if everybody um, tries to take a look at the survey responses and think about them. And if you didn't do the survey, Go up in the message, maybe do it. Are you welcome to? Um, and and there will be more of these, right? And you're able to kind of feed the questions that you want to have on there as well. This is an ongoing kind of background conversation, right? And it, and 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 we can all be riffing off of it as the weeks go forward. For people who had difficulty with the um, form, could you copy paste answers and put them in a document because I know there are a lot of people who said they couldn't yeah, see. I, the very first time I took the test on the phone, uh, I was able to see what I said. The link that shows me responses after the very first time is permanently gone. 
on both my phone and my yeah you have to go into it again and basically fake take it and just push go on so if you go back into the little quiz thing it'll there's one text box that you have to fill i just put a random character in it oh, and then went on and it will take you back to it that's the there's no way just to get to the res results i found that out right before we began the, the truth of Google is this unfolding process. So this is only a moment in its development, all right? So um, same with the syllabus. If you have the printed copy of the syllabus, realize that's also an unfolding process and that it's being edited as people bring in comments and suggestions. So if this is only a frozen moment in time and there will be many more. Um, so with he that. He the 10 commandments on the I'm ready for 13 weeks of negation. Yeah. Awesome, Good everybody. Everyone, I'm already over. Including me. Any last words online before we peace out on you? Peace out. <laughs> oh, there got, you all are. Oh, you can see yourselves oh. now. Wow, this is meta. Yeah. The Wait, can, oh, they can see the mouse now. There's two that. mice. I should. <laughs> the camera's going on. reminds me of Lacan's vase diagram. <laughs> Where, he, where he's basically trying to draw out like our imaginary identification in the mirror stage type thing. But where's the real though? Where, where is it? All right, everybody. It's been great. Um, yeah, I've got lots of other things that I'll take up in the chat. Take care, everybody. Oh, bye. Thanks, everybody.